All right, thank you uh, for joining me today, everyone. Uh, I'm Roth Michaels, a principal software engineer at Native Instruments. Uh, we're a company that makes hardware and software for digital audio, everything from mixing and mastering records, helping DJs, uh, set for DJs, um, producers making beats, and post-production for film and television and radio. And so that's why some of the examples you'll see today come from the digital audio world. But don't worry, you don't need to know anything about audio or DSP. Um, they're just some simple API examples. And we're part of a bigger family of brands that joined together recently. I only mention this because our story today um, starts at Isotope before we became one um, giant uh, plug-in making family. So why did I want to give this talk today? And you'll find out if you haven't read the full abstract what it is in a moment. Um, but it, it goes back to when I first interviewed at Isotope and uh, my favorite interview question that my manager asked me during my phone screening, which was to rate yourself as a C++ developer on a scale of one to 10, but before she lets you answer, the, uh, the number does not matter. Say a number and then say, what's somebody who knows less than you, what do you know that they don't know? And what does someone more experienced than you know that you would need to learn and level up? And, um, and I've stolen this question, I love using it in interviews. And my answer was, I know how to use templates for generic programming, I know about toy examples of metaprogramming, but I don't really get how template metaprogramming works is my answer. And it turns out, Templates, unless you're a really junior developer, is almost always what somebody brings up. Whether they mention templates at all, template metaprogramming, people asking me how partial specialization works, Sphenai, substitution failure is not an error. If you don't know what that means, that's totally okay, because the point of this talk is that you don't need to know that anymore. Um, so I was kind of inspired to, <laughs> I was inspired to uh, teach this talk because we were um, getting ready that our prep work in December was planned to move to using C20 internally. Um, we have to wait a little bit sometimes for Apple Clang. And, but a month before, there was a problem with some already templated class that a junior developer needed help with, and the answer involves Fini, and I was teaching him how to use it to solve the problem, and he kind of understood it. I told him, oh man, this is really too bad, because in, uh, in a few months, uh, we could just use concepts instead, and this would be really easy. Um, so I'm going to show some examples in this talk of using concepts to solve certain problems and then also show you how this might work in the past using traditional template metaprogramming techniques. I'm not going to really explain all the details about how that old stuff works. If you want to understand things like that, void T, et cetera, there's a great talk from Walter Brown that goes into all the details of really how, what metaprograms look like and how they work. I'd rec if you're into this stuff, I recommend watching it. Um, but anyway, let's get down to business. So. Um, our story starts with uh, generic programming uh, using templates, and this kind of will bring us on a journey to uh, Const Expert, which has been a nice feature for compile time programming we've had for a while. So at a very basic level, um, uh, templates allow us to have generic algorithms in the standard library. So we can have a string that says hello world, and we use find to find the comma in it, or we can have a vector of numbers and use the same find algorithm to find 42 in it, and templates are what allow us to do this. And after this was invented, I think you know, Wikipedia and other places say it was discovered by accident. I mean, um, Erwin Unruh was doing real work, so I don't think it was an accident, but he discovered you can actually write um, programs with this. Uh, his first program didn't actually compile, but the result came out in an error message. Um, but it turned out that templates were Turing complete. And um, it's definitely true. I implemented a Lisp uh, quickly in templates. I'm not going to show it to you because that's a whole other talk and we're not at a Lisp conference, so we won't um, force that on anybody. So a simple example of how this works is um, if we're going to use kind of traditional techniques uh, to calculate a Fibonacci number, um, you, this is kind of the algorithm on the bottom you see. We have a static assert that uh, if we ask for um, Fibonacci of six, that it would equal eight. And this is what traditionally a template meta function looks like, where you have some struct and a colon colon value that's your result, and the template parameters are your arguments uh, to the function. So the way this works is you have a, um, your general case um, for this recursive function to calculate Fibonacci number, where you put your integer in, and you uh, calculate the um, previous Fibonacci number and previous two, and then you have your two base cases that just have a, a constant value of one and zero. Um, if you didn't quite follow that, that's okay because we've had const expr for a while and now it looks like this and it's like a normal recursive function we'd write to write a runtime um, Fibonacci function and this is starting to look 
more like normal C++. And that's what we're going to kind of see throughout this journey that there's a lot of cool stuff we can do both just for compile time, calculation, and other metaprograms that don't look like um, wizardry anymore, but just normal C++. And it even got better with things like now we have auto, so we don't even have to put template type name T. We can just say, like, oh, yeah, we're going to take any N here. But this algorithm is not going to work for floats. So here's where we start to get our little taste of concepts. Instead of just saying auto, we can use this uh, concept from the standard library. And don't worry if you don't know what concept means yet. We're going to dig into this in a moment. But we can, instead of just saying it's any auto, this is only an auto that's some unsigned integral type. And that is the requirements for this algorithm. And now you know, there's no way you can use it wrong or get weird stuff happening if you put in floats or um, string or something weird like that. Um, and with C++20, ConstExpr has got a lot more powerful. You can actually allocate memory in it now in certain circumstances, as long as it doesn't escape from the function. Um, that allows us to have ConstExpr standard vector and standard string. If you're on a, a standard library version that has that implemented yet, myself developing desktop audio software, we use Apple Clang, so we have to wait a little bit. And there's also ConstEval, which as we won't really talk about in this talk, but the difference is ConstExpr is something that could be evaluated at compile time, and ConstEval is kind of forced to be evaluated at compile time. Um, before we get into concepts, uh, there's another kind of cool trick that was added in C17 that I just want to show, which is going to come back later in our metaprogramming example, which is a fold expression. And this is a really cool thing, because in the past, you could have a variadic template that took an arbitrary number of arguments, and you could pass those along to other functions and just splat those out. But if you wanted to actually do something other than calling a function with them, there really wasn't a technique other than recursion. But this allows us to do something really cool now, where let's say we want to write a function that sums an arbitrary number of types and arguments. Uh, we can write it like this. And what this means with the dots on the left and the plus args, and the args is our variable number of template arguments. Um, and we see our start, we're going to sum 1, 2, 3, 4, and get 10. Um, this is essentially, um, in this specific example, that, is, that assert sum will get instantiated really into a function that um, looks like this. It takes uh, four ints in this case, and it's going to add A and B, then add C, and then add D. Um, and just wanted to give you a little hint here. It took me a while to remember because there's two ways you could do these fold lefts and fold rights. I actually don't bother reminding myself which they're called anymore, but the way to think about it is if the dots are on the right, you start pairing things from the right side. If the dots are on the left, as we see here, the parentheses start on the left side. Don't worry about which one's left fold or right fold. Just if the dots are on the left, your first parentheses, your most inner parentheses are on the left. But um, just to show you what this had to look like before, um, we would actually have to do this with a recursive um, template instantiation where we have some base case that if you have one argument just returns itself and we recursively call it. Again, not going to cover a lot of detail here because we can just splat them out this way and it's a lot more um, easy and fun. And so we'll come back to those full expressions in a later example, but just wanted to kind of prime you on that now. But we'll get into the meat of this now, which is C20 concepts. Uh, so concepts are a way of instead of just having a template type T, uh, as we saw earlier with the, the std integral, unsigned integral auto, it allows you to say what this T is and place some restrictions on it. And there's a lot of different places you can put these uh, concepts. So you could, for example, instead of saying type name T, you could have some concept T, and so you can only um, put that there. You can further refine that instead of putting inside your angle brackets. You can also put a requires um, clause after that and say, oh, T also has to be concept two. You can use them on return types with a concept name and then auto. You could also put a concept and then auto, as we saw earlier, as a argument to a function. Or if you need to actually like want to do something with that X or something in your um, seeing if the X matches the concept, like. Um, you can also put a, a trailing require. So in this case, you want to say, like, oh, we require that whatever calling x, uh, passing it to bar, the type of that has to meet concept C5. And if this seems a bit mysterious, don't worry. But basically, I'm just showing you all those C1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is where concepts can go in a function declaration. And uh, we'll see in a moment what actually um, making your concepts looks like. So. We're going to first start off looking at what it's like to uh, create overload sets with concepts. 
and constrain you know, what types we can pass to our functions. So uh, in this example, we're going to write a function that's supposed to divide something in half. And so a simple kind of naive way, we can write our own overload set where we have a um, specific functions for float, double, and long double. Those will get picked first if you're passing those types. And if you pass something else, and we're hoping it's an int, um, we're going to uh, divide by two and round up. But there's kind of two problems with this. One, we had to stamp out essentially the same function three times, saying float, double, long double, and there's nothing that stops you from passing a string to this other than getting a weird compiler error. Um, and, and just as an aside, people often talk about uh, compiler errors as being kind of the nice thing about concepts, and we'll see some nice error messages, but for me, it's really much more about um, it's so much more accessible to write this stuff than traditional template techniques that it's more accessible to more people to even write this stuff in the first place because I think most people aren't even getting those weird error messages because they kind of try to stay away from templates, but you can use concepts. So let's take a look at what this would look like um, with const. Oh, I, I guess I already went over this point, but yeah, we have our generic case and our um, floats. So Instead, we can do something like this, where we have one template that takes an arbitrary t, and then uh, another feature of constexpr is you can have this if constexpr, which if you use it inside of a template, that means if the if constexpr branch is true, inside those bra braces is the only code that gets generated. The else doesn't even need to compile. And if it's false, then the else needs to compile, and the true does not. Um, but again, this doesn't get us all the way there, because we know, okay, we're going to do the right thing if it's an integral type, but still, if we pass string in, it's going to do something weird in the um, else, or you could put, you know, um, standard file system path, and it's going to do something strange, or actually probably still break because of the T2. Um, so we can improve this a little bit more. Instead, we can uh, write two overloads and use concepts in the name of the arguments. So we have one that's saying, we have this function for any integral type. We'll do our division and round up. Um, and then if it's any floating point type, we'll just divide by two. But what if you want to use something that's not a um, built-in type, but something else that you can do math on, like some custom strong type that you made? It won't pick either of these overloads. So what do we do about that? Um, and we write our own concept. Uh, and this is we actually we're going to see our first example of making a concept. We have a concept that's going to be can half, as in can I divide this thing by two? And so the syntax here is we give it a name can half, and we use that everywhere instead of type name or the other concepts. And so this means that for either function we can only pass something that's can half, and then we have this uh, requires expression that is going to say like okay, for if we assuming you have some t that we're also going to name lowercase t. Um, this expression, t over creating a t uh, with a 2, this has to be valid and something that can compile. And then the arrow means whatever that valid syntax is has to then also satisfy this same as concept. Um, and there's kind of that arrow is some special magic where same as actually takes two um, variables or types to see are these the same thing. So that arrow essentially kind of implicitly puts the expression on the left saying, is that the same as t? So in this concept, it's saying if you divide something in half, it has to give you the same type back. So maybe not ideal for all situations, because like std chrono, um, this would not pass the concept, because you divide two durations by each other. You just get a float or a double or whatever. Um, but this is just a simple example. But we have a small warning. Achtung. Um, I've been hanging out with my German colleagues. I speak very poor German. I'm trying to learn better. So here's our German word of the day, danger. Um, there's a very easy mistake you can make when you're dividing your templates, um, which is if you want to use one of these requires clauses within inside, basically, you know, if you're using other concepts within inside this requires clause. So this is an example from an earlier version of this talk I did internally. that I was making this very silly contrived thing about you know, concatenation rules, but essentially this concat plus, the point of this is saying, um, if this types has, if your two types can be added together and they're the same, and, or when you decay them, they're the same, and they're not arithmetic types, uh, then you can cat plus them. So string is an example of this, because you can do 
a string plus a string, they're the same thing. Um, the first string's not an arithmetic type, the second string's not an arithmetic type. But an easy mistake you can make is leaving out this requires keyword there. Because if you just have um, this, this doesn't mean that this has to be true. This just means this has to compile. And so even if like, you've passed instant to this, this would be true because it's valid to call is, ar is, is, is arithmetic on an integer. Um, but if you put this requires in front of it, this is saying that it actually requires that this concept that you put to the right is true. So if you're ever using a concept within one of these requires expressions, make sure to always put requires because um, this means, is this true? This means, does this compile? Is that resonating with everybody? Cool. Just wanted, uh, it's an easy mistake to make that I've made myself, and you wonder why your concept will just kind of work for everything, and so just watch out for that. So, like I said, error messages I don't think are really the exciting part about concepts. One of the really cool things, and when I kind of surveyed my coworkers about why they were excited about C++20, concepts was a major thing, and I was like, well, you haven't used these, why are you so excited about it? And API documentation was a big one, and we're looking at some specific examples that I had coworkers say like, oh, it would be a lot easier to know how to use these uh, classes if we had uh, proper API documentation. So we're going to look at one example of a concept that we've actually been using in our uh, digital audio code base for a while that we call in-place processor, that we weren't using C++20 concepts. It was just more a philosophical rule. When we write some digital signal processing code, it always has this shape so we can reuse it in various places. And so what this concept looks, essentially this is a very simple example. Um, imagine we have some um, processor that's going to take your audio and essentially invert it, flip it. So whatever floats you put in, uh, it's going to revert them. So the key thing is basically this in-place processor concept is just something that has a function called process that takes a span of some amount of floats, because that's normally what you're dealing with in digital audio is you have processing some arbitrary um, buffer of floats. In real life, this is actually probably like an MD span because we're dealing with stereo or now like you know surround sound stuff, et cetera. But to keep our example simple, we're just going to assume that we just have a span everywhere that we're processing audio. And so this is what a very simple in-place processor looks like. It's so a little bit more complicated version, which is not a requirement of being an in-place processor, but sometimes you have some audio code that needs to reset itself. So don't worry about what's actually happening here. Um, this is a very simple digital filter. But the kind of the key thing is it has this state that um, it always keeps track of what its last value is, and it needs to use that in the next calculation. And then you know, imagine your user like is doing some work and they're playing their audio and they hit stop. When they hit start again, you want to reset back to the beginning. So um, keep that in mind for another example that all of our audio processors have a process function. Depending on what they do, they might have a reset function. So. Um, for an example of what, how we can use it for documentation, imagine that we have some piece of signal processing code, and we want to wrap that in some other utility that does some pre and post processing. So you'll see in this example, the process function, you, we pass in some uh, processor um, that, um, I just said, uh, this example, we're using class instead of template in the template parameters. It's, it's the same, don't worry about that. Uh, and we see we take in some processor and our process function just does some pre-process work, don't worry what that means, does something, then calls process on the buffer, and then does some post-processing work, and then the reset function just resets the internal processor. So we're basically taking some piece of audio processing code and wrapping it with some pre- and post-processing. But if you remember what I was mentioning earlier, um, oh, actually, oh, I'm sorry, we'll get to that point in a second. So in this example, this is kind of the, Classic way you document this stuff is just with a comment saying that, well, your um, class processor type could be anything. So we have a comment saying it has to have a process function and it has to take a span of floats. If you pass something else, then you'll get your scary um, big pile of uh, template error messages. We can upgrade that a little bit by having a static assert and we can make a type trait and this is kind of our pre-C++20 technique where um, we make a type trait, and I'll show how that works in a second, um, that if this type we're passing in processor type is, has this process function, it is an in-place processor, and this assert will pass, 
If not, the assert will fail, and hopefully that will be a little bit better error message than you would get out of traditional, just, you know, the ugly spaghetti of uh, template error messages. And this is what this looks like. Um, there's kind of some funny stuff going on here. We got this uh, standard false type, standard true type. What are those? Stood void T. We have decal type, decal val. Um, then we make and we have these two structs, and then this constant bool. We have template specializations. It's kind of weird. I was actually talking with someone at lunch about what void T does, and I actually used it for a few years before I actually understood. I just kind of would button mash until it worked. But we don't have to worry about that anymore. Instead, we can just write this. We can all just take a breath and relax after that crazy template code. Because what this does is this is just defining a concept saying that for some class T, there's a concept in place processor requires that if you have that T, that, and I'm saying I'm declaring a T and naming it P because it's a processor, and it has to be true that it can compile, that you can call process on the T, passing it a, a span of floats. And that's way easier to write than this because you're just basically writing, this is what I want to be able to do. If it compiles, the concept is true. If it can't compile, it's not true. And then that allows us to, instead of putting comments or static asserts, we can now say that it's a template in place processor processor type. And now you'll get a very nice error message where if it's, you don't pass an in place processor, it will say, oh, this is not, is not valid because you don't have a process function in this shape. But there's one little problem here. Uh, when I discussed earlier, um, this example is saying the only requirement is this has a process function. But you see in reset, we call reset on the processor. So what if you pass in our first example inverse that had no reset? You're allowed to do that. Just because you constrain the template doesn't mean you can't do other stuff with it. And we're back to getting our you know, old school template error messages um, uh, for that reset there. So, oh, sorry, that was an extra slide. Um, so there's a way we can get around that. We can actually combine const expr with concepts and conditionally call that reset. So what this is doing is saying at compile time, we're going to, and then instead of using a name concept, this is, you can actually just write your concept uh, requires expression just in line like this, where you just say, if const expr, we require the processor type P has a reset. And if we do, we call reset. So if we pass something that doesn't have a reset, um, our wrapper's reset is a no op. But if it does have a reset, we can call it. One warning about this, I really would not recommend you write ex requires expressions in line like this, but actually always create name concepts like we saw in the Ken Half example. Because when you start combining concepts and specializing, like, oh, this, con this, this thing needs to be this concept and this concept and this concept, if you, all, if you use name concepts, it will work like you intuitively expect. If you use them inline like this, it could get a little funky because uh, even if the concept is exactly the same text, they actually count as different concepts and they're, they're in different source locations. It's, it's kind of confusing how it works. The point is, name your concepts and it will always work how you expect, but I wanted to show you an example of what it looks like otherwise. And there's you have another option. What if instead of making reset a no op, we want our wrapper to not have a reset if the internal thing has a reset. So instead of using the if const expert inside of it, we can just put a requires clause at the, uh, oops, sorry, I went the wrong direction. We can just put a requires clause at the end of the reset function. And in this case, if we pass in a processor that doesn't have a reset, the whole reset magically disappears. Uh, yes, question? Does that include requires clause? It does. Uh, yes. I, yes, it does. Thank you. I, I knew, I compiled almost all these examples of the unit tests, but that one, I knew there must be something in here I typed up and didn't compile, and there it is. Uh, yes, you're right. That should say requires, requires, because you have to say requires some concept. Um, actually, if we go back to, uh, yeah, here. So see how we have this requires C5? Instead of writing out some name concept like C5, um, we would handwrite our concept. So that actually should be requires, requires. Thank you very much for the uh, compiler error for me there. <laughs>
Yeah, so this example is how we make it. If you requires requires, it'll make this disappear. This will tell you, I don't think the error message is actually that great. It says like expected, if, it will say expected expression at the parentheses, I believe, um, which is a bit confusing. If you see that, you might need requires requires. <laughs> Uh, so another example of using uh, concepts is a API documentation, and this is the one that my colleagues found particularly useful, is we have a pattern sometimes in digital audio where we, something we call a block processor, where we might be running in some other program that gives us little chunks of audio at a time to process, but maybe we have some, and it might give us, you know, 32 um, floats at a time, it could give us uh, 2,048 floats at a time, but let's say we have an algorithm that only works on 512 at a time, so we have a utility that you know, brings in some input, um, saves it up, uh, and then when it's ready, calls some other function on that. And so in this example, uh, this block processor takes some constant input, it ha you give it a, a span of output to write to when it's ready, and you give it a function of what algorithm you wanna call. But in real-time audio, this is not cool. Uh, because standard function will allocate if the lambda captures are too big and allocations are not real-time safe because they are um, involved system, um, you know, dealing with malloc and stuff, and it's uh, non-deterministic how much time that is going to take. So we don't want to pass standard function here. So normally the answer is make this a template and just allow you to pass in the lambda type directly. But now the downside of this is when we have the function, it's very clear, oh, what it takes. It takes a function that is a span of floats and returns void. This, now we're back to what does this do? Do we put a documentation comment in here? So we can improve this by using one of the concepts in the standard library by instead of using a type name process function, we can say um, standard invocable with a span of floats. And now we're saying we don't even care about the return type. All we care is that this process function can be called the span of floats. And now we have our documentation back again. Uh, but we can actually make this a little uh, nicer. We don't even have to uh, use the template and the pointy brackets. We can use uh, auto in here and just say this argument and write directly where the argument is. This, is ha this, um, uh, this auto has to be something that is invocable uh, with a span of floats. Do anyone have any questions before we kind of move on to our metaprogramming example? Yes? Um, uh, because in this particular case, um, imagine, I don't know, you had some um, function that was going to like um, change the volume on something and return a flag um, if it got to a certain point and like you would use that in some piece of code. It would be actually totally okay in this case for the block processor. The block processor doesn't really care about the return type. Normally our process functions return void, but it's just uh, less restrictive than the std function example, which forces you to specify the return type. In this case, all we care about is how we call it, and it allows you to kind of use some algorithm that might have a return, but saying this uh, thing we're passing it to doesn't care about the return. It only cares about the, um, what you invoke it with. You could write a more complex concept that says, you know, what the expected return type is. Um, but in this case, we're saying, yeah, pass us anything that we can call this way. If it returns, we're just gonna ignore that. And, oh, I'm sorry if I didn't repeat the question for everybody or the people online, or maybe it was clear by the answer, but the question was, why do we not care about the return type? All right, now we're gonna get into some exciting territory. Um, actually pulling all this together, the fold expressions, the concepts, and concept expert, uh, for some metaprogramming. And this is actually the, one of the other inspirations for this talk. Um, a few years ago at CBPCon, I gave a talk on some work we did on internal UI libraries and how we moved some runtime uh, error checks to compile time uh, using templates and some template metaprogramming. And someone on YouTube called me out for like, oh, you could have used C++ 20 concepts for this. And it was true, but I didn't put it in the talk at the time because um, the Xcode versions and Visual Studio versions we were using didn't support it. and I hadn't used it in real life and I figured I'd probably mess it up. Now that I've used it, as we saw, I already messed it up with the requires requires, so it wasn't in that talk, but now that I know about it, I wanted to share this with you. So this is a kind of an example from part of our UI library where we have a way of d defining some properties of widgets by having a struct that's in a certain shape. So imagine you have a property that's for like a button that's size, and it has a few things that are required. It has a, uh, you specify a type, so in this case, size is a float. Uh, 
you have a static const expert name. Um, this is a size. And you have a default value um, that's the same thing as type. And so we have a default value of 100. And we will use this in, and here's where our fold expression comes back. This is not actually how this works, but it's kind of a toy example. So imagine you have something that has some properties, and it's basically all this thing is doing right now is you're going to fill in a bunch of types um, when you create this thing, and it's going to use that fold expression to call add property on every type you pass in on creation. And what that add property is going to do is just add to this dictionary the name and the default value of the struct you passed in. So in this case, it would add um, size and 100 uh, to the map. But we ran into trouble with this, because it turned out not everything we wanted to have for a default value or a name could be known at compile time. And so we couldn't just have const expert values here. What if we sometimes needed to use a function? Uh, so you know, we have size, where everything is const expert here. But um, what if we have a title that's a string type, and we don't have a compiler yet that has a standard library that has a const expert string? We have to actually just make this a runtime function to get the default value. But if some properties just have a value and some have a function, this is not going to work anymore. So what do we do about this? Um, same thing with name. Maybe you have, again, you know, we're using a standard, let's say we're using a standard library that doesn't have um, context for strings, and let's say you have some templated thing for an optional property, and it's going to prepend the word optional to the name of whatever thing you put in. Again, we need a function for name. So how, let's take a look at what it would look like to write a, a function that is going to return the right value, whether it's a name function or a name value. So here we're going to use um, uh, if const expert. Again, the dirty um, requires inline clause. And um, this one only needs one requires, so I know I compiled this one. I have, yeah, yeah I, had, I, had, I have a main that tested all of this example. Um, so you're saying that if at compile time, t um, name is something you can call with empty parentheses, then do the first block and return calling name. If not, just return name's not a function, so it must be just a name, so return that. We could add some other concepts to this to make it a little bit more defined, but that's kind of the simple way of doing it to see, like, oh, is this, a, is this something I can call? If so, call it. If not, just return it. It's a little more complex for the default value case, um, or maybe not more complex, but just another way of approaching this. So we can write a, con a name concept in this case has default value function. And if it's tr true that you can compile that with the default value, that works that way. Um, and then we can have a get default value that takes that concept, and that one will be selected if you can call um, default value as a function. And then we have another concept, um, has default value, um, that the check here is like, well, if, the, if the type of default value is the same as the type of the property, then, oh, it's just a value, um, then use the second um, over, thing in the overload set that takes the has default value concept and just returns the default value. Uh, and so now, instead of using name and default value directly, we call get name t and get default value t in our property holder, and it will either call the function or return the thing, whatever is appropriate. But wouldn't it be cool if we didn't have to have a default value? I mean. Let's say we have a border width and it's a float and we want the default to be zero. Why do we have to type that out? Like that's, you know, default initializing a float is also going to give you a zero. So couldn't we just leave this off? Yeah, sounds good. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This, oh, yo, yes, I'm sorry. I, this fonts are so small, I thought I was on a different slide. The point is this is a bit small, but this is the error message you'd get. And what this is telling you is essentially the cool thing about is there one template error message example? Um, when we now at, try to use a property that has neither a function nor a value that's called default value, we get an error. And unlike some other errors we get in C++, this one actually has the word because in it over and over again. So it's actually telling you exactly what's wrong here. Um, that it doesn't specify, satisfy default value function because it doesn't have a t colon colon default value parens is not legit. And the same thing with the other concept also doesn't have that. It has no member called default value. 
Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, we can add another overload, saying that the temp um, that the t is something default initializable, and in that case, um, we just default initialize uh, the type. Um, but I th this is going to cause us a little problem because size is a float, and this is also default initializable. So both border width and size are both satisfying this get default value. So now that we add this third concept, we're going to get an ambiguous overload because it could call this one or our uh, previous one on the bottom here. So how do we solve this? And this is what I was mentioning before about um, why you want name concepts when you need to actually combine them to make something more specific. Uh, so in this case, we're going to uh, make this default initializable one say, okay, we want to take a T as default initializable, but don't take that overload if it has a default value or a default value function. Uh, so we require that um, both those other concepts are false and that your default uh, initializable. What does this look like in the old way when we had to use Fini? I'm not going to explain it, but um, this is the C++ 17 version, which is, fits on one slide. Uh, if we didn't have if const expr, then that git name would actually have to be multiple git name functions that we would turn on and off by this Fini thing, which is substitution failures on error. It means that, oh, if it doesn't compile, then the template just disappears. But well, there's only certain contexts where that's true, other times a compiler error. But again, we don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. And actually, this is kind of what the full, uh, so that's what name looks like. It's pretty simple. This is all the stuff we'd have to write to do the default value part of it. And um, uh, instead, we have these just nice, simple functions that look kind of like normal C++ instead of this um, temple metaprogramming, again, the void T showing up, decal type showing up, true type showing up. We don't have to worry about that anymore. OK, here's the part where you have to wish me luck. I'm going to switch to Emacs in a moment, and we're going to do some live uh, TDD. And I've done live demos with compiled software before. This is the first one I've done uh, with the audience this big um, actually coding. And so we'll see how it goes. Um, very briefly, if you've not exposed to test-driven development, the kind of high-level concept is you write some test, you watch the code fail, you write the minimum amount of code that makes it work. So for example, if you had a function you're testing that 1 plus 1 equals 2, you write a test that says 1 plus 1 equals 2, that's required, and then you would just write, oh, um, functions return 2. That's all you have to do to make the test pass. But then you refactor it later, actually, make your function do, add the two arguments, and hopefully your tests still pass. Don't worry about that too much. That's, we have a whole lecture on TDD. If you don't know about it, maybe you'll learn something through osmosis. So in this example, we're going back to another audio example. We're talking again about these. We're going to use this in-place processor we used before. So again, we're going to be working with types that have a process function that takes a span of floats, and they maybe have a reset. So imagine i a guitar player, and I want to be able to switch between a uh, kind of distorted metal guitar sound or a jazz guitar sound. So we're going to make some wrapper processor that's going to take our, distortion, our metal guitar sound and our jazz guitar sound and put them in something that I haven't switched between sound A and sound B is what we're going to do in this example. And this is the last slide, so we'll go to Emacs. Here we go. All right, turn on mirroring. System preferences. OK. Cool. So um, and oh, I am sorry. I should step back uh, one commit to show you. Um, Uh, where we're going, and then we'll get into the example. Where we are going. So um, we're making this processor we call the AB processor. It's going to take a shared pointer to um, two processors of arbitrary types, and it's going to have a set processor function. 
that we can call um, with this enum above A or B to pick do we want effect A or do we want effect B is a process function that's going to just run whatever effect is currently selected. And it's going to have a reset because maybe these effects need a reset, maybe they don't. Um, in real life, there's a lot of other stuff you have to handle, like fading between the two effects, et cetera. We're not going to talk about that. We just want to see, are we processing with A or are we processing with B? And you know, I've already started off with having um, in place processor here instead of type name. Um, but to avoid, um, to um, get us started uh, in our TDD, we're just going to say the in place processor concept is true. So regardless of what type you are right now, um, it's going to be true, and we're going to see how we can use a concept to build up um, what this concept actually does. And this is also going to be how we, um, this technique is uh, how we avoid that problem I mentioned earlier, where you can pass something in, like in place processor, that you expect has a process function, but it doesn't stop you from trying to call foo on it, trying to call um, get on it, or whatever, and it will work if it's there and work if it's not. So this TDD technique is what will try to protect you from the fact that you can do other stuff with your uh, concepts. So let's go, uh, what, let's go to, uh, what time is it? Let's, we'll do the short demo. So we, have the, uh, so we have some more time for questions. So we'll have the cooking show version of this. Um, so I've already been writing some tests and um, making them green. Uh, so let's look at our tests. Um, Uh, so there's two uh, fakes we're using in this case, uh, and they're not all built out yet. Um, one is we have this struct um, gen 42. So this processor in our unit tests is just going to output 42. Every, when you pass in a buffer, it'll set every one in the 42. And we have this IOTA processor that the first time you call it, it's just going to start counting up numbers from zero. And then when you, and later we'll add a reset when it, we would want it to reset to zero. And just to save some time, we already have an implementation of process here. And we see a static assert that both of these are in place processor. And right now, this is always true because in place processor equals true. But as we develop that concept, this is, these two static asserts are what will keep us honest that we're actually, our fakes are exactly matching the concept. And so our first test is going to be that we're going to have Gen 42 is processor A, uh, IOTA processor is processor B. And uh, the first test is that we want, actually, I'm going to. Let's just uncomment a few of these and see where uh, we fail. Yeah, I'll just uncomment this whole test case. So, and then I'll go over what the tests are, and we'll see which ones are failing at this point in the cooking show. Uh, oh, actually, I planned ahead, so I will leave those uncommented. Uh, so, first test is before. If you don't call set, processor A is what's being used on construction. If you call set with B. Um, B should be called, um, and let's uh, run these tests to make sure we're in a good state before we start doing more stuff. Okay, finish. All tests pass. Exit green. Cool. We're in good shape. So let's um, add some more tests. Um, so the, this first test, so this is going with the test did. So the first test is saying that we're going to, we created our processor. Uh, we're going to call process on some buffer, and we expect that the result, because it's the um, Gen 42 is the first processor, is just going to be 42, 42, 42, 42. Then our next test is saying, OK, we're going to call set processor B, call process, and then we expect the output to be 0, 1, 2, 3. Then our next test is saying, OK, if we call process again, we expect the IOTA put out 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, let's see what happens. Oh, exit two, error. Huh. We expected four, five, six, seven, but we got zero, one, two, three again. Uh, let's look at what's going on in our implementation and uh, see what's up. Ah, here's what's going on. In our proper TDD workflow, we wrote, wrote the minimum code to make the first test pass. We're not even using any processors. See, the constructor just doesn't do anything with the arguments. It just throws them away. And it just assumes, yeah, if, you, if you're on A, fill it with 42. And on B, we're going to call IOTA. And that's why it starts from zero every time. So this test is exposed. OK, we need to make this um, real. 
Um, so we're going to want to call, instead of calling IOTA, uh, we might want to do something like, um, you know what, I'm going to actually go the logs instead of type uh, so we can cook each other some more. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah, thought this was going to be a bit tricky. <laughs> Let's save our current state of our tests in a stash. And No, apologies. I'm sorry. We'll just write it for real. Um, I'm getting confused in the git commit. So our temptation would be, okay, first let's actually do something with these processors. So um, we need a um, our shared pointers of our two processor types, PA and PB. And we need to actually use them. So we'll have name this A, we'll name this B. called the members MA, MB, and we'll actually assign them. And then our temptation might be, okay, let's actually use um, uh, our our processor B here to get the test to pass and do something like this. But this is the rule we're going to not do when we're using concepts writing our tests because now we've called a function that isn't in the in-place processor concept. So we want to actually do a TD cycle and before we're allowed to call anything on an in-place processor, we need to add it to the concept first so we make sure we're not calling any methods that are outside the processor. So this is not, we're not allowed to do this yet. So the first thing we have to do is instead of this being true, uh, we will make this equals requires and require that um, t, that as we've seen before on the slides, that the is, um, we can call this with a span of floats. Now if we run our tests again, let's see what's up. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, it would. Um, I'm mean, expecting it to fail, but for a different reason. Uh, oh, man. I'm, I'm sorry, can one person say, can one person at a time say it a little bit louder? <laughs> and the concept says that the greatest of the Oh, yeah. um, Danke schön. All right. Ah, okay, here's the failure we want. So, um, error, static assert failed. Um, Gen 42 is not an in-place processor did does not satisfy uh, this constraint, and we probably have a because. Um, well, we know why. Uh, we don't need to worry about the because. Because um, if we look, it doesn't do anything. It has no process function, so let's give it one. Um, and now we know we're keeping ourselves honest that both of our um, um, fakes actually implement the concept. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, begin buffer and buffer 42. Uh, and we didn't uncomment, so it compiles now, and now we need to bring back our um, tests. 
Mm, sorry about this. Uh, I think I'm just messing up my uh, um, git moves, so we'll just uncomment these again ourselves by hand. All right, that's the state of test from before. Compile. All right, we're back to our failing test of we expected four, five, six, seven, and we got zero, one, two, three. And now that we have um, actually added this to the concept, now we're allowed from a you know being nice to ourselves perspective. Of course, the compiler would let us do it anyway. Actually, call um, process on these things. Uh, if we compile, tests will pass. And so the point I'm trying to show you here is if you're writing any unit tests against something that is using a process, um, using some concept, never call anything on that type until you've added it to your concept and like seeing your fakes fail and then you add it to the fake. Because again, uh, we're out of time um, and I'd like to save some time for questions, but the same thing will come up if I um, we want to add a reset method here. Uh, and call, you know, if I were to do reset, this is not cool because um, our concept doesn't have reset and um, our fakes don't have a reset. Um, we could add a reset to the IOTA processor because it needs one. And that reset would just look like this. Uh, and, um, and really what we would want is, and I'll just kind of, we'll kind of cooking show this again. Um, Sorry, I'm, all right, this is uh, stash these changes. Okay. And to show you the end state here, uh, AB processor. So we add a new concept, can reset, and we did that before we called reset anywhere. And then we did our if const expert again, this time being nice to ourselves and using a name concept. So if um, const x, if can reset, um, then we call can reset. You know, the simple version of this um, would look like this. Um, um, but I think it's a little bit more uh, explicit to say, instead of saying that PA, just to make sure you're not making a mistake, that PA, well, PA is a um, MA, um, this is a little bit more explicit saying that the type of the thing when you dereference MA and remove any references satisfies this concept. Um, and so the kind of the point here is when you're writing tests with templates, before you call any new functions, add them to your concept, see your fakes fail, add it to the fakes, then, um, then you're allowed to use a new method. And um, with that, we will quit Emacs, and I have my um, last slides on the desktop. Oh, man, weren't we supposed to do video capture? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>